Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Our moderator today is Katie Choi, and Katie Choi is a nursing director here at Washington Hospital, and she's a nursing director for patients and staff education. She was appointed to the project director of the Washington Hospital Sepsis Program, and she has been a nurse for over 15 years. She has a master's degree in nursing and is board certified in two nursing specialties. Here is Katie Choi. Every day, we are exposed to a variety of infectious organisms such as bacteria and viruses through the air we breathe, the water we drink, or even the cuts or bruises that we acquire. Our immune system is constantly at work keeping us healthy. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce two physician speakers who will be talking to us about sepsis. With a show of hands, how many of you have heard of the term or the word sepsis before? Wow, we have very good. There was a study that was recently done that only 60, actually 60% 60 of, of Americans have ever heard of the term sepsis. The first presenter I would like to um, introduce is Dr. Naveen Bhatti. Dr. Bhatti has been an emergency department physician for the past seven years, and he is a local Fremont resident. He actually graduated from Mission San Jose High School and has been working here in our emergency department for the past three years. Followed by uh, Dr. Bhatti would be Dr. Carmen Akawili. Dr. Akawili is also another local Fremont resident who has been serving our community for the past 20 years. She is currently our medical director for our intensivist program. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Bhatti, who is our first speaker today. All right, so sepsis is important. It's the 10th most common cause of death in the United States. The, uh, here are the leading causes of death in the United States. There should be a list here. Number one, heart disease. Number two, cancer. Number three, stroke. Number four, chronic lower respiratory diseases. Uh, we call that COPD, emphysema, just chronic lung diseases. Smoking contributes to a lot of that. Accidents, that's kind of self-explanatory. Diabetes. And uh, the complication of diabetes, which can include heart disease, stroke, stuff like that. Uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, influenza pneumonia. Number nine, nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, and nephrosis. Ne nephro means kidney. We'll just call those into like chronic kidney diseases. Dialysis is an example of that. And finally, septicemia, why we are all here today. All right, so why is it important? Sepsis costs $17 billion a year. I think that might even be uh, increased for this year as uh, we recognize it more and more people get ill. That uh, number will obviously go up. Let's see, nationally, 61% of sepsis cases are first encountered in the ER. I'm assuming the other 39 would be encountered in your primary care offices or clinics. That's why it's important if you're, you know, recognizing you might have an infection or a fever. It's, ER is always a good place to go, but if you're able to walk and you're not feeling, you know, not feeling totally bad, you can always go see your own doctor and uh, they can go from there. All right, severe sepsis, septicemia, approximately 40% death rate. That's, again, why it's very important to recognize this early, very important in the ER to recognize this early. If we can prevent it, this spectrum of infection all the way to sepsis and septic shock, if we can kind of stop it early in the progression of the disease, we can decrease this 40% death rate because once you get kind of that certain kind of, kind of point of no return, then you're obviously going to have a worse outcome. Um, what is sepsis? That's why we are here. So uh, very, very basic. It's the body's overwhelming response to infection. Uh, can be widespread in the blood scene. That's typically how it'll progress. So you can develop a 
pneumonia, you can develop a urine infection. That's fine. People have all had that before. But if you don't catch it in time, you have risk factors which may decrease your ability to fight this infection. Then it can get in the bloodstream, for instance, and uh, a urine infection can get in the kidneys. From the kidneys, get into the blood, into the body. That's essentially what sepsis is. Um, this is kind of a complicated slide here. Um, what, what you're supposed to take from this, essentially, is you understand um, we're talking about a spectrum of illness starting an infection. SIRS, something called systemic inflammatory response syndrome. That's not really important uh, for today, but again, it's just a spectrum of illness to sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, and death. Um, just briefly here on, the, on your uh, right, you see um, pancreatitis, trauma, and burns. Those are just other non-infectious causes of something that progresses to SIRS, which then you can get sepsis from. That's really not important today. We're worried about infectious causes of SIRS and sepsis. What causes sepsis? Any ideas? What are the common causes of sepsis? What are common causes of infections in human beings? No? All right, so in the ER, we're very, uh, you know, whenever somebody comes in with a fever, it's, it's, it may, we kind of break it down to a simple thing of, you know, okay, if somebody has a fever, where is the fever coming from? You break down the body systems. Is it coming from the lungs or urine? Those are the two common causes, again, of, uh, of infections in most people. It's either a pulmonary issue like a bronchitis or a pneumonia, a urine infection, pretty self-explanatory. That occurs most commonly in women. Uh, other Obvious examples, wound infection. Again, you, get, you can get a cut on your finger. That's an infection. If you've got risk factors which decrease your ability to fight the infection, such as diabetes, you don't have a very good blood flow to the area. Because of your diabetes and your high blood sugar, it decreases your body's immune system uh, uh, ability to fight this infection. That finger infection then can be a blood infection. Again, then we can progress on to sepsis. Uh, bowel infection is another important thing, not quite as common. Uh, that's something called, you, you've heard of colitis or C. diff colitis, that's a common uh, cause of this. Uh, bowel should also include a gastrointestinal tract, so a gallbladder is a very common cause of an infection which then can progress to sepsis. And finally, central nervous system, um, that's like a meningitis typically, if, uh, if you're going to have something like that. Who's at risk for sepsis? Again, like I mentioned, diabetics are at high risk of sepsis. Um, but age is a very common cause of sepsis. Now, sepsis typically will hurt or, or affect the very young or very old because of their diminished immune systems. But um, as an example here, you can see there's a 20-year-old model that uh, I remember her maybe out of five, ten years ago. She developed a urine infection, and that urine infection progressed again to the kidneys, from the kidneys into the body, and she actually died of sepsis. She was a 20-year-old female who was healthy uh, up until that. Uh, some other uh, well-known people, I guess. Pope John Paul, he was 84. He died of sepsis. And finally, uh, Jim Henson, I believe he died of pneumonia, which then progressed to a blood infection and then, again, progressed to sepsis. Chronic diseases are, again, a very high risk of sepsis. Uh, anybody can develop a pneumonia, but somebody who, again, has a decreased ability to fight infection, these are the people that are at high risk of developing the body infection and, again, sepsis. Diabetes, like I mentioned. Heart disease, again, decreased blood flow. Uh, you know, when you talk about heart disease, you talk about, you know, hardening of the arteries of the heart. You have to understand the whole body is connected. So if you're going to have hardened arteries in the heart, you can, you're going to have these uh, bad arteries throughout your body. That's going to, again, decrease blood flow to these areas and uh, increase your risk of not being able to fight this infection appropriately. Kidney disease, again, a chronic... Uh, Chronic kidney disease, a dialysis patient, these people are all very high risk of developing infection. Uh, the, the kidneys will help you fight infection if they're not functioning appropriately and through a variety of different mechanisms, uh, you will be increased risk of getting infection. You're also considered immunocompromised if you're a dialysis patient. Lung disease, again, uh, lung disease is going to increase your risk of developing a pneumonia because you have the bad lungs and again, it'll then decrease your ability to fight this infection. Uh, lung disease, again, COPD, bronchitis, bronchiectasis, these are all different chronic lung diseases which, uh, you know, if you have, you need to take care and be careful. If you start developing a cough or a fever, you need to go in and see your doctor urgently. Uh, again, you don't want to uh, wait and let this thing progress. 
Um, this is just a very classic example of a pneumonia. This is a, I mean, we'd see this in the emergency department every day. You can see in the uh, upper lobe of the right lung field of the patient, you can see that all that white stuff. Now that is what a pneumonia, or a pretty bad uh, lobular pneumonia looks like. Um, it looks like this because again, when you have infected tissue, um, the tissue itself gets swollen. You have a lot of uh, pus and all that stuff developing in the lungs. And because of that, the x-ray, the radiation won't go through and then it shows as a white spot in the lung. You can see what healthy lung looks like, which is all the black stuff, which is all full of air. Again, x-rays can go through air so you can, it'll be black, but again, the pneumonia itself will be uh, white like that. Um, another risk factor for uh, developing sepsis or developing pneumonia would be on mechanical ventilation. You're again bypassing the body's typical pathways to help provide inf uh, prevent infection. Now you've got, you know, if you're breathing normally, you've got, uh, you know, hair cells in your nose and hair cells in your throat, which are going to help crap all this bacteria and dirt. When you're on mechanical ventilation, you're essentially bypassing all these mechanisms to help fight, uh, help prevent infection because you have a plastic tube going straight into your lungs. You know, that's going to be, could be uh, pushing bacteria directly in the lungs where they are going to develop into a pneumonia. Cancer is a risk factor. You're immunocompromised when you have cancer. Um, you know, blood flow is decreased. There's a lot of other variables. But in addition to that, if you're on any chemotherapy agents or any sort of immunosuppressants, which are going to help uh, fight the cancer, that's also going to weaken your own body, weaken your immune system. Again, like I mentioned, with these risk factors, you're going to progress to sepsis. Uh, like I mentioned, weakened immune system, another common cause of a weakened immune system we're all familiar with is HIV. That again, uh, you know, decreases your immune response, decreases your immune cells, and again will increase your risk of developing an infection, which then will increase your risk of going into a pneumonia. Invasive procedures, that's kind of self-explanatory, like I mentioned, you know, any sort of, even a peripheral, if you get an IV in the hospital, that's a potential source of getting an infection. Any sort of surgery, like a knee replacement surgery or intra-abdominal surgery, you're kind of bypassing the body's mechanisms to help prevent infection because you're cutting open skin and all that. That's gonna, that could introduce bacteria into the, into spaces of the body which are not used to bacteria, the spinal cord, joints, in the belly, um, any place where you, uh, have instrumentation and the possibility of introducing bacteria into a place where bacteria are not supposed to be, that's going to cause an infection. And then again, like I mentioned, you know, you can get an infection, it won't necessarily be sepsis, but any infection could potentially become sepsis. And again, people with these risk factors that help, that, that diminish their response to an infection, that's what will progress to sepsis from a simple infection. Um, after surgery, there's uh, risks of developing infection and again sepsis after any sort of surgery. During the surgery, you may be intubated, you may be on mechanical ventilation, you may have peripheral IVs or a central IV, you may have a Foley catheter. These are all kind of uh, foreign bodies which are inducing the body, which are bypassing the natural, uh, your body's ability to help prevent these infections. And again, after surgery, you're typically a very weak. Your immune system's probably not as active. These are all reasons where a simple infection could progress to sepsis. And I think we have a video next. It strikes suddenly. There was no warning, nothing. Friday evening, she was perfect. Saturday morning, she woke up, started getting worse and worse by the hour. It strikes swiftly. It, it's still it's just astounding to me how fast this, this thing moved. You know, he was Sunday night, a man with pneumonia, taking antibiotics, and then Monday morning uh, was dying. Its aftermath is often fatal. I understood that the situation was very bad. And then I said to my husband, I don't know if I can make it this time. It's a mysterious illness that has plagued mankind since ancient times. Today, it is ranked as one of the leading causes of death in America. It is called sepsis, the body's overwhelming, out-of-control response to infection.
sepsis is a severe bloodstream infection that afflicts an estimated 750,000 Americans annually and kills 35% of them. That's about 245,000 people every year. The early stages of sepsis feel a lot like the flu. Uh, general body aches, shortness of breath perhaps, fever, chills, uh, and this represents the, vect the viral particles circulating in the bloodstream. And in fact, some of these patients actually develop organ failure as do patients with sepsis, and the mortality is in the thousands of patients a year from the flu alone. Her saturations are quite good. She's running about a 93% saturation, right. which is a normal saturation. Right. Even with the most advanced and potent antibiotics, septic shock remains the number one cause of death for patients in intensive care units. These disturbing numbers reveal that sepsis is more than your everyday infection. It is a medical emergency requiring immediate action. Infection is common. You commonly get an infection of your skin or of your throat, um, uh, pharyngitis, um, but if the bugs, especially bacteria or fungi, get into the bloodstream and spread around the body, that is what we call sepsis. Sepsis is what people used to call blood poisoning. It's when an infection produces an intense body response and the response itself uh, puts the body at risk. It is this intense body response to the infection that makes sepsis so dangerous. And what was the first thing you noticed? In sepsis, the body is responding to these invading microorganisms in a very overzealous way. And in fact, it's kind of an overreaction. So the patient's own immune system is actually causing tissue damage while it's trying to kill the bacteria. Vaxin Payne and his family know how deadly sepsis is. Overnight, he went from suffering from simple pneumonia to total cardiac arrest. Like wildfire, sepsis affected his entire system despite the fact he was on antibiotics. What happened with him happened so quickly. I mean, just from walking, being able to walk yourself into the emergency room and sign yourself in to being absolutely out as if you were in a coma. All we knew at the time was that he had uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, which is uh, lung failure, essentially, that was probably due to pneumonia. They were assuming he had sepsis. Uh, and he'd had this cardiac arrest. He was doing poorly but reasonably well uh, on Friday and by Monday he had multiple organ failure, was in the intensive care unit and over the next three weeks was very close to death. His internist came out and he said, Miss Payne, you want me to tell you he's going to be all right? And I said, oh, I sure do. That's exactly what I want. And he said, I can't do that. So um, it was touch and go for a long time. What causes the body to shut down so abruptly? Pathogens like bacteria and fungi enter the body through wounds, burns, medical and dental procedures, or surgery. They grow and release toxins. Dispersed in the bloodstream, the toxins cause the blood vessels to dilate, increasing the total volume of the circulatory system. At the same time, the walls of the blood vessels become leaky, allowing fluid to seep out into the tissues lowering the amount of fluid left in circulation. This combination of vascular dilation and decreased fluid causes a dramatic decrease in blood pressure and reduces the blood flow to the organs. The immune system overreacts to the toxins, producing massive inflammation and blood clots in small blood vessels and coagulation in the extremities. This further decreases circulation through the organs. When blood is prevented from getting to the organs, Septic shock, or the shutting down of major organs, occurs. Septic shock can lead to multiple organ failure of the respiratory, renal, and cardiovascular systems, and may ultimately cause rapid death. To understand sepsis, you need to understand inflammation. We all see inflammation when we get an infected sore on our arm. It gets red and it swells. That's the body producing inflammation to fight the bacteria that's causing the infection. When that inflammation gets into the bloodstream, 
it inflames the entire body. What are the warning signs of sepsis? When we return, we'll tell you the telltale signs, as well as the risk factors for this deadly disease. Although anyone can contract sepsis, a healthy person is not likely to get it because normally a healthy person's immune system can handle most pathogenic invasions. We have a very impressive uh, host defense mechanisms. These are defense mechanisms that the human body has that allow us to handle uh, infection. And they consist of the uh, physical defense mechanisms, the skin, the upper airway coming into the lungs, the uh, esophagus and stomach having acid in it so that the bugs can't get into the GI uh, gastrointestinal tract. Um, these are remarkably uh, effective uh, host defense uh, mechanisms. However, these defense mechanisms do not always work, even in healthy individuals making us all susceptible. The elderly and newborns, because of their age, are particularly vulnerable. Others at risk are patients with suppressed immune systems. The immune system can be suppressed by drugs used to treat cancer, autoimmune disorders, organ transplants, and diseases of immune deficiency, such as AIDS. Malnutrition and long-term illness can also increase the likelihood of contracting sepsis, as do pre-existing infections such as pneumonia, urinary or gastrointestinal tract infections, and skin ulcers. Pathogens may be introduced to the bloodstream by surgical procedures, including endoscopies, indwelling catheters, and drainage tubes or intravenous equipment. I had a very bad headache. And then uh, I was very weak. I was feeling my body very heavy. I couldn't move. I wanted to go to the bathroom. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. The odds were in favor of Marguerite Mutaris getting the fatal infection. Her battle against ovarian cancer weakened her immune system. Because of her medical history of stem cell transplants, chemotherapy, and total parental nutrition, or tubes used for feeding, and her presenting symptoms. Doctors suspected sepsis and identified her source of infection quickly. The blood pressure uh, was very erratic. I mean, it was going up and down, up and down. And finally, it was settling at about 40, over 18, 40, over 20. And uh, the emergency doctors thought that it was time to take her to the uh, intensive care unit. This patient came to the intensive care unit in the middle of the afternoon with a very low blood pressure. She also was growing bacteria out of her bloodstream, so we knew that she had infection. She did, however, have a catheter that had been placed beneath her skin into the large veins that drain into the heart to get chemotherapy. Marguerite had the classic signs of sepsis fever, chills, rapid heart rate, difficulty breathing, decreasing blood pressure, confusion or delirium, decreased urination, malaise, and general achiness. As these symptoms are seen in a wide variety of conditions, including the simple flu, in some cases, detection and diagnosis are more of an art than an exact science. We're talking really about a continuum here. Um, that is, somebody who has a uh, urine infection and has pain on urination and doesn't have an elevated heart rate, doesn't have a fever, that person would have a urinary tract infection. If that person had pain on urination and they had pain in their flanks, suggesting their kidneys were involved, and they have a fever, a high heart rate, um, they're diaphoretic, uh, commonly they uh, feel nauseous, uh, may have vomiting. There's a big, uh, what we call systemic reaction. That person has sepsis. However, since it takes only hours for the organs to start failing, the consequences of missing the early signs of sepsis are dire. 
so a septic workup is usually ordered. What is your chief complaint to why you came here? Well, my the septic workup involves first a good history, finding out what is the patient's problem, where are they having pain, where are they suffering. Secondly, a good physical exam to determine what tissues seem to be involved or inflamed. And finally, culturing the tissues that are appropriate, like spinal fluid, blood, urine, peritoneal fluid, for example. Yeah, you can, can't you? Yeah. Unlike Marguerite Mutaris, Wanda Griffin was not a likely victim of sepsis. The 23-year-old mother of three was in seemingly perfect health when suddenly one evening she got a headache and backache unlike any other she had experienced. So a headache and a backache on that same day that the lymph nodes started swelling up? A few days later, Wanda is in the intensive care unit of Vanderbilt University Hospital. She is unable to breathe and her fever hovers around 106 degrees. Well, and, and here, of course, we had to put her on oxygen, this nasal oxygen here, because her, her blood oxygen levels have been low, uh, still running about 89, even with the oxygen. Although no source of infection has yet been identified, doctors by now are fairly certain she has sepsis. The doctors do what they can to manage her condition, but they are puzzled. What is the source of this infection? And why is it so out of control in this otherwise robust young woman? It's not really clear why some people can have a simple strep throat, for example, and uh, do quite well with it with simple antibiotics, and yet the next person comes along with the same strep throat, but then develops multiple organ failure, shock, needs life support in the ICU, and in some cases even doesn't survive from this problem. With a blood pressure of 36 over 24, Wanda's lungs have shut down. Her kidney and liver are failing. On a ventilator, she is dying. What will be done to save her life? Coming up, we'll look at the arsenal of weapons used in the battle against this invasion. For more information, please log on to our website. Stephen, how's she doing today? She's doing better than she had been, but we still have a lot of issues. Because death can occur within days of onset, treatment is started, usually without the test results of the septic workup. Treatment typically consists of the following. Two or more types of antibiotics initially, until the organism is identified. Intravenous fluids, either blood or protein solutions, to replace the fluid lost by leakage transfusions of plasma or platelets to treat coagulation and hemorrhage. Medications such as dopamine to increase blood pressure. Supportive therapy of the lungs, kidney, liver, if failing. This includes the use of oxygen, ventilators, dialysis. Wanda's condition was very critical from the first moments that we saw her. She required life support within a very short period of time of arriving in the ICU and over the next several uh, days to weeks uh, developed uh, multiple organ failure involving the liver, the kidney, the lung. In order to keep her body from total shutdown, Wanda Griffin receives all these therapies for almost a month. Miraculously and mysteriously, it is enough to save her life. Incredibly, these treatments worked for Faxon Payne, too. He survived after being on life support for three weeks. And the fact that once they uh, finally got me off the respirator and uh, got me up uh, and sat me in a chair, I couldn't sit up straight. They kept having to tie me up so I could stay up straight. I was so weak I couldn't, couldn't stand, couldn't sit. And uh, I remember I had to really learn to walk again. Treatment also includes identifying the source of infection and surgical drainage, if necessary. In the case of Marguerite Mutaris, that meant removing the catheter tunneled under her skin and used to give her chemotherapy. In septic shock, she too spends a month in the intensive care unit before her body revives. I was told we may lose her instantly uh, when the person becomes hemoseptic. In half an hour, they're gone. It's scary. Half an hour is not enough time to, to, to react, but she made it. While these treatments have sometimes been successful, they have only curbed the infection and maintained the failing organs. 
they have not addressed the body's overzealous response to the infection. The release of toxins, blood clotting, and the inflammation and subsequent shutdown of organs. As a result, too many sepsis patients still die every year. So guys, cheer up. It's not too depressing. So 40% mortality, we still have 60% of being able to survive this. So that's why we're doing this community education because you're part of this. If we recognize sepsis early and you bring them to the doctors early, you come to the doctor early, we might be able to make the mortality rate less than that. So I'm just here to review to you the signs and symptoms that you have already seen uh, in the video presentation and I hope you remember them because that's very important. Community awareness is important. Awareness of sepsis. You have to line it up even if it's the tenth most common. It's time sensitive just like heart attack and stroke and abdominal aneurysm. If you don't diagnose this early then you'll have a problem. You'll get into this overwhelming infection. A boil or cellulitis can become overwhelming and could have the fever and all those toxic things that you saw on the video. So what are the signs and symptoms of sepsis? They're, they're very broad, but we'll, let's review it again. So fever and shake, shaking chills was told about and a very low blood body temperature. So either high fever, 101, 104, or very low, like 96, 95. Altered mental state is very important because you can have the flu symptoms but if your mental state is altered, that tells you something else is going on. Especially in elderly sometimes. Also, I want to mention to you that sometimes we don't have fever in elderly. Sometimes it's just altered mental state or low appetite and things like that. The nausea and vomiting that is worse and intractable with the diarrhea is very important. And the low urine output. Remember, that was also noted on the video. So the lungs are always almost like in 50% of sepsis is involved. The 102 fever and chills, coughing up with mucus, the shortness of breath, and then your heart rate increases, <coughs> chest pain and when breathing or in coughing. So I think most of us now are well informed and most of us hopefully is doing our blood pressure, our heart checking and things like that, at least when we're like 50 and above, we start looking at our health more readily. And for those that are young, probably because you're, you care about yourselves when you exercise, you also check your pulse rate. So most of us probably know how to do that. So again, emphasizing increased heart rate, or you can feel your palpitation, or you can just feel the pulse. Or if you have a stethoscope, listen to the heart rate, the difficulty in breathing, and low blood pressure. So what is a normal blood pressure? That's your usual blood pressure. If your normal is 130 over 90, then 110 over 80 with some symptoms of getting dizzy is probably low for you. But usually it's less than 90 over 60 in general. So I'm usually 90 over 60, you know, at this age. So my low blood pressure will be less than that. Some people are, you know, when you're older, your blood pressure is 140 over 90 usually and you get dizzy when you're 120 over 80. And again, as they said in the video, this is continuum of the signs and symptoms. You have to look at the big picture, from just an infection, to having fevers and chills, to altered mental state, and to being shaky. And it can be fast, depending on your risk factors. If you have immune problems, you have diabetes, and things like that that we talk about, about the risk factors, then it can be so fast, that's why it's time sensitive. In healthy adults, sometimes it could be just a couple of days, but in elderly, immune, you know, immune, non-immune competent patient, it's okay, but if you're immune suppressed, it can be fast, like minutes or hours. So of course, the health history is important when your symptoms started, at least for the healthcare providers, all of your symptoms are important, the color of your mucus, the chronic illnesses you have. These are sometimes we get it from the patient and from sometimes from the family. As in the community, it's always important to help to uh, 
have the recent trips you've made, the health of other symptoms. The recent trip is because sometimes if you go to uh, Bakersfield area, that's where the Coxie family is, or somewhere in the Colorado area, you have all those ticks and mites. So uh, that's why you know, doctors sometimes ask those questions. If, especially if we don't know anymore what's going on, we ask all those health history or travel history. Remember the SARS from China and things like that. The health of others at home also is important because you could have uh, gotten the cough from a family member. And then of course the medications you're taking. So also those with very high or low white blood cell count when you have a blood test or even when you come to the hospital, uh, we also look for infection. Most of the time it's leukocytosis which is increase in white count. Sometimes in viral infection, the white count is normal, and in some other cases, it's even low. So that's a red flag for physicians. And now it's a red flag for you. You look, ask your physician, Doc, what's my white count? I'm having some low-grade fever. I, I have a, you know, a boil in, in my, you know, so you can ask that. And sometimes you've heard that in overwhelming sepsis, it can affect other parts of the body. You know, like blood poisoning, it affects the kidney, the liver, and you might have altered liver or kidney function. And then they talk about adult respiratory distress syndrome. Okay, adult respiratory distress syndrome is a bilateral infiltrates, the criteria is bilateral infiltrates, very low oxygen, and it's not due to heart failure. But it is not just due to pneumonia. Pneumonia is one of the causes of adult respiratory distress syndrome. You might aspirate, you might have GI bleed, you might have an infection from other parts of your body, but because the cells of the body, um, you know, dilate, it, it leaks, then everybody else, everything else in the body leaks, in the kidney, in the lungs, and you get into adult respiratory distress syndrome, and the respiratory system fail, and you might need to be intubated. So this is not just a pneumonia, this is just an abnormal lung, and we call it adult respiratory distress syndrome because it's due to inflammation, not necessarily infection. So now that we know what sepsis is, it's a spectrum of SEERS, which is high blood pressure, uh, low blood pressure, fever, tachycardia, fast heart rate, increased respiratory rate, that's systemic in res respiratory response, and we have to have a source of infection. That's what you call sepsis. Sears plus infection. So you can have sears but no infection, like what Dr. Bhatti said. You can have pancreatitis, inflammation of the pancreas. You can have burn, because if you have burns enough, you can have high fever and chills, but not necessarily infected. If it's infected with all those symptoms of fever, chills, and you know, res high respiratory rate and temperature and things like that. That's called sepsis. And that's when you have to think, wow, let me call my doctor, or let me go to the ER. And the, how do we treat that now? Now that we have identified what it is, how do we treat it? And that also has been reviewed in the video. So again, I cannot emphasize prompt and appropriate treatment but rapid screening in the emergency department and wards is important. That's what we do in this hospital. And now it's gonna to go to the community. You, as the listeners now, uh, is encouraged to be responsible, to be aware of sepsis, and maybe tell your family about it, right? So we start early intervention. Once we recognize it, and by the way, at Washington we have a screening tool, and Katie will discuss more about it later. And the way we treat it is we just don't treat the symptom. We have a bundle of treatment. Bundle means several things that we start together. Not just, oh, I need to start the blood pressure. Oh, the blood pressure is low. I, I, I need to start antibiotics. Oh, the blood pressure is low. I'm going to give fluids. No, we do them together. Because it has been shown that when you do bundle treatment, like uh, several treatments together, that the mortality rate is low. The success of treating the sepsis is better. So we do that at Washington Hospital, and we um, recognize this, and we, of course, uh, through our clinical societies and the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, we incorporate everything that we have learned from this. 
And then uh, part of our treatment is to also the diagnostic test. We do, as the video was saying, blood cultures to know where it is, urine cultures, and we also measure serum lactate level. It's a chemical that's produced when there's decreased blood flow in parts of your organ system. If there's decreased blood flow in your kidney, decreased blood flow in your heart, and things like that, they usually increase. But it's only important for sepsis if there's an infection, right? Because in cardiogenic shock, there's decreased blood flow to the heart, the lactic acid goes up. But leave that to the doctors. I'm just giving you a, an idea. You can, my, he said, my mom has sepsis. What's the lactic acid? You can ask that, I guess. But maybe Dr. Bati will not encourage you because he's in the ER. You might ask too much, right? But it's nice to be informed that the doctors has some parameters aside from the diagnostic eye to, you know, to show them. There are other ways, but uh, those are like procalcitonin, but you know, it's not yet, um, what do you call this? It's not used in the United States. In Europe, it is. So, so the bundle treatment is, aside from the diagnosis of getting lactic acid, we give right away within one hour IV antibiotics, within I think four hours in ER, in ICU within one hour, and then we give IV fluids, we call it goal-directed fluid resuscitation because their blood vessels are dilated, their blood pressure is down, we give them you know, fluids right away to bring up the blood pressure and we give them part of the supportive care was the uh, vasopressors to increase the blood pressure. We're also very cautious not to give too much and flood them with fluids. That's the doctor nurse thing. Okay, so that's the treatment. Uh, a lot of research are still ongoing in terms of how we can treat sepsis as a whole. You know, remember there's inflammation and there's infection. We can treat the infection most of the time. We, if we know that it's bacteria, we can give medication. If we know that's fungal, we can give the infection. But the inflammation is what's making the sepsis hard or all this end organ failure hard, we still don't have a specific treatment to them. Just like when you go to the war, you've killed your enemies, but all the destruction that has been in the war, you still need to clean it up. And that's how I kind of do to sepsis. But the most important for the community is to know how to prevent it. And it's just general, general things that we can do. Like number one is washing our hands. So we wash our hands before eating, and when we drop our food, and if it's really a bad, you know, a very dirty place, please, there's no five second rule or two second rule. Don't take it back, especially if that's, if you're very healthy maybe, but if you're immune compromised or, you know, you have all these risk factors, please, don't take it. So the way uh, they suggest is rub with soap and water and running water for 20, 30 seconds. And I think uh, we were you know, told by the nurses, educated by the nurses, you sing happy birthday. And that's too, too long for us, you know, because we're like, but I guess it, it needs to be done. Like after the happy birthday, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And then you're done with washing the hands. <laughs> and, and there are also some alcohol swab that you can use, right? And it has to dry up. You can't be wet and holding something anymore. You have to dry that up. And about, I think you need at least two seconds for that. And for C. diff infection, Clostridium difficile infection, you need to wash with hand and soap or Clorox. And you have to use friction, and then we told about hand sanitizer. And please get vaccinated. Like your flu shot every, uh, somewhere in October, I think, or they even start um, September now. And this will only prevent you from four, the four deadliest type of influenza virus, not from all the viruses. So you can, have, you can still have viral illnesses, but just not the four deadly types. Then pneumococcal vaccination, especially uh, when you're 65 and above. Again, of course, uh, you want to protect others from the infection. You're, you want to stay away from anyone with compromised immune system. You know, when you are immune compromised and you want to kiss somebody that's sick, it has to be flying kiss and not contact kiss, right? And you, you have to kind of just maybe handshake and not contact. So it's accepted nowadays. 
wear a face mask if you have respiratory illness and cough with a tissue. You know, because when you cough like that, you might not know it, but the next one will hold, I will hold my, <laughs> touch this one, and then I do this, and lo and behold, you know. So you have to do those kinds of things for other people as well. And of course, we have to stay healthy. We try our best to stay healthy. We try our best to do moderate exercises. I'm telling that to myself too. And we have to keep our immune system strong. It's all those basic things, but we're just reminding all of you, for all of us, to do it. So healthy nutrition is important. Diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and lots of fluids. Okay, and now we uh, have Katie to tell you more about our program at Washington Hospital and how we have succeeded in some ways. Thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited to share with you about the sepsis program here at Washington Hospital. Here at Washington, the patient first ethic is what we're committed to. What that means is everything we do, we put patients first. And since we started this sepsis program in, since 2007, we've had tremendous support from not only our board of directors, our hospital administration, including our CEO, Nancy Farber, and our senior associate director and chief nursing officer, Jan Wood. But truly, the success of the, success of the sepsis program has been due to the multidisciplinary team, which includes, of course, our physicians, our nurses, our respiratory therapists, and our pharmacists. And I want to share with you today um, some of the things that we have done to make it such a successful program. The first is, when we started out our sepsis initiative, we educated all of the physicians and nursing staff to get them on board with what is sepsis, kind of like what we're doing today. Because four years ago, you know, most of us were familiar with that term, but in terms of the treatment bundles, as Dr. Akawili mentioned, we've adopted evidence-based guidelines that were developed by a team of international experts that pretty much they're using it now internationally. The second thing that we've done is we've also developed our protocols and our policies and our practices uh, based on these evidence-based guidelines, okay, that have been uh, researched and have been proven to be effective to provide that appropriate uh, care. And third, we've measured and we've also been monitoring since we have started the program our outcomes. So when we start, first started our initiative, we set our goal to reduce deaths due to sepsis by reducing it by 25%, okay? As you know, the mortality rate is very high for sepsis deaths of 40%. So our goal was to reduce where our baseline was by 25%, and I'm very pleased to report that over the past several years, we've consistently sustained, and we've actually made, we've even not only achieved our goal, but we've improved it by, we've reduced it by 29%, so we've even, did better than what we've set out our goal to be initially. So in treating sepsis, time is of the essence, and a person can become very sick very quickly, so noticing the signs and symptoms of sepsis is very important. That will contribute to a rapid diagnosis and prompt treatment. So we decided with our sepsis program, we've already do done our due diligence in, within the hospital setting. So we wanted to build that awareness in our community because for those of you, um, we needed to reach out to create a greater awareness of sepsis. And so one of the efforts we have done for the past three years in a row has been doing seminars like today to educate the community. We've also done um, articles in the local uh, newspapers, if, for those of you who have seen an article that was done a couple of weeks ago, so that you will be the first to recognize the signs and symptoms of sepsis. In the hospital setting, whether you come through our emergency department or you're transferred from one department to another, all of our staff, it's part of our practice now. It's part of our daily routine, if you will, that we rescreen. When we mean screen, we assess, do you have any signs and symptoms of sepsis? So we do it for all patients in any area of the hospital. The other important point to note that when you receive your care at Washington Hospital, we base the guidelines on your treatment all evidence-based, okay, so that we are current with what's the most effective treatment out there regarding sepsis. 
But most importantly, with the program, the sepsis program here at Washington Hospital, we have saved lives through better sepsis care. For those who, of you who are interested in hearing or learning more about sepsis, there is a charitable organization called the Global Sepsis Alliance. And it was initially formed to educate and um, create awareness about sepsis, not only for patients and families, but also healthcare professionals. And this resource is, you could access it on the internet, it's free, it's www.sepsisalliance.org. And there's healthcare professionals as well as the lay public who volunteer their time to put out information, blogs, simple, simple information regarding sepsis that I find a very useful resource that I go to at times. I just have one question. Uh, what's the correlation between SARS versus sepsis? Is it SARS the same thing as sepsis, or, or is that just a different yeah, beast? Go ahead, go ahead. SARS is a respiratory illness. And it's mostly due to inhalation of bird droplets, I think, you know, the one from China. So you have a respiratory illness and you have fever from, like for example, it's like a pneumonia. You develop a pneumonia with fever. So if you have SEERS, which is the systemic inflammatory response, fever, increased heart rate, difficulty of breathing, that's two criteria, and you have an infection, then yes, it is sepsis. SARS is just one, part, one um, what do you call this? It's one, uh, uh, one illness that causes sepsis. So yeah, it is sepsis. If you have the fever, if you have the SEERS and the infection, which is the pneumonia and the SEERS, the fever, the high, high white count, the respiratory rate that's fast, together there's sepsis. Okay, um, uh, uh, I've had hives really, really bad for about four months now. And I don't know whether that has anything to do with the immune system or not. So, um, I don't know. What, what do you, uh, so, okay, so. Um, well, that's a difficult question to answer. If you're asking, do you have sepsis? No, you do not. <laughs> Um, but I but mean, you need to go to your doctor. yeah, yeah. Hives, okay. hives is, is, is an immune response to some sort of antigen or some sort of uh, your your body is responding to some sort of insult. It yeah. also tells you that probably you have a good Very immune good. response <laughs> <laughs> because it's reacting. But it's not sepsis. It's yes. not so, infection. But I mean, so then, what is good immune response? I don't know what that is. What is that good? We're just okay. commenting on the fact that you know you have enough of an immune, res immune response to fight this uh, antigen or whatever. Um, it it just means your immune system is functioning good, actually maybe too good. That's why you're responding to some sort of insult. Um, why why do I have hives? Dear, that's, yeah, uh, that's you a need to go to your doctor. Can't answer that because that's not sepsis. Today. It's not due to infection. Yeah. Okay. How about MRSA? Is that uh, sepsis? Yeah, that's go, go ahead. Uh, MRSA is just a type of bacteria which is kind of prevalent in the community, which uh, essentially uh, is resistant to a lot of different type of antibiotics. So, you know, in the emergency department, we need to recognize uh, somebody who may have a MRSA infection and give the appropriate antibiotic. Um, but any antibiotic, I'm sorry, any, any bacteria could progress to sepsis, absolutely. That will make it more complicated, like you mentioned, because if you do develop a uh, MRSA sepsis, we have to be very uh, particular about which antibiotics we give you. Yeah, but yeah, we have to be very careful of that, absolutely. So there is now a MRSA in the community. It used to be just a hospital infection. MRSA, methicillin resistant staphylococcal aureus, used to be a hospital infection, but now it's widespread in the community, and it's nice that you know about it. Because it can also happen, if you have a wound, it can happen to a healthy person. So doctors are aware of that, they treat that, and it can develop, as Dr. Bati said, into sepsis. You have the boil, by MRSA or cellulitis, but as long as you don't have the fever, the white count, the tachypnea, the altered mental state, remember, you have an infection, but if you don't have those other things, it's not sepsis. So it becomes sepsis if you have the sears, the fever, the white count, and all, and the infection. Okay, but it can. 